comic book fans are genuinely the worst when it comes to rewriting the narrative of past films to fit their own agenda. To the point that no matter how clearly great or clearly low in quality a movie may be framed on screen, every tremendous film is somehow overhyped and every bad film is miraculously underappreciated. And other than like Star Wars with the prequels, never has this been more egregious than when it comes to the discussions surrounding Spider-Man interpretations. As from Maguire to Holland, people keep letting unchecked personal biases add contention to movies that are clearly what the majority say it is, whether good or bad. Most of the time, these biases are simply a product of his time, being based on whatever trendy ideology is currently floating around, as those hyperinflated needs that will make past iterations seem better or worse are always sparked by something seen or missing in the newer films. And that's precisely the case when it comes down to the Amazing Spider-Man franchise. If you haven't been keeping up with film Twitter, which trust me, I understand if you don't, you would know that ever since the first wave of rumors spread of Andrew Garfield, Spider-Man making a cameo in Spider-Man No Way Home, the discussion surrounding the true brilliance of the Amazing Spider-Man duology seemingly makes its rounds every couple of months. And every single time, it's one of the most baffling experiences considering that the discourse is a complete 180 shift of what was once a widely accepted thought and that the Amazing Spider-Man movies aren't really the best, with the first being quite decent and the second one being flat out atrocious. These were popular notions that pretty much stood the test of time until people were reintroduced to this Parker variant back in late 2021 and from a mixture of mentally linking the No Way Home performance with the Amazing Spider-Man films as well as hyperfixating on the limited things done well, the narrative altered from a bad movie with some pretty good aspects to a series that was just completely overlooked, blackballed, and was an underappreciated masterpiece, whose biggest flaw was simply coming off the back of the OG Maguire franchise, and that's why it bombed that low, which honestly isn't the case. There is a legitimate reason as to why these movies weren't regarded as great originally, with horrible writing, underdeveloped inclusions, and overstuffed plots just being the tip of the iceberg. It even sucks more knowing that studio interference played a big part in this franchise's misfortune, but actually going out there and searching through the rationale for this rejuvenated popularity, it kind of becomes clear as day as to why these modern audiences are attaching themselves to this project. And no, it's not from The Amazing Spider-Man just being an overlooked gem that's finally getting its recognition, but more is this a response to the current state of the MCU. You see, while the Amazing Spider-Man stock is rising like crazy, the MCU Spider-Man has seen itself having a slight fall from grace, with Spider-Man Far From Home in particular being a major victim to the pseudo-revisionist history, going from an amazing MCU sequel for the poster boy of Marvel to some considering it to always be the first sign of the decline in the MCU for Phase 4 and forwards. Again, a baffling sentiment considering that the initial response for this project was that it was the best the MCU could have done directly following the spectacle that was Endgame. Now, I'll be the first to admit this movie is probably the weakest of the Holland trilogy and has almost always been regarded as such by the general public and critics alike. But it's no coincidence that this movie in particular is facing that mass pushback over the other two Spidey MCU films. It's also the same reason as to why there's no coincidence that the Amazing Spider-Man franchise in particular has been continuously brought up since the Garfield return. And it's because it's never been exactly based on if these movies are truly good or not, but more of what these films represent fundamentally. I mean, just think about all the comic complaints that Marvel has been dealing with as they've been maneuvering through their controversial Phase 4 and now Phase 5. Everything from their very formulaic plots, to scenes that are either too dark to even be seen or too dull to even care about seeing, the visual effects at times are not at all which should be produced by a billion dollar corporation, and many times they hyper focus on the laughs which is an ultimate tension killer and makes characters become comedic caricatures of themselves. Now while it's to a significantly lesser degree to project seen in later releases, Far From Home is unfortunately the spidey flick that applies the most to these criticisms, as its peers are the more subtle yet natural Spider-Man Homecoming and the more hard-hitting and emotional Spider-Man No Way Home. These issues weren't as identifiable back in the summer of 2019 when Far From Home was released, but with us familiarizing ourselves with these tendencies nowadays, it sort of taints any rewatch of this MCU sequel, making Far From Home sort of the Spider-Man film that represents the most of everything that would eventually become wrong with this company, and would lead to a good portion of people to develop this MCU fatigue. Now while these current triggers for comic book movie lovers are severely limiting those from embracing Far From Home's actual quality, it's these same triggers that are heavily propelling the Amazing Spider-Man series, as a lot of the defining aspects of this franchise coincidentally plug into the holes of what MCU fans have been complaining about, leading to the Amazing Spider-Man franchise unintentionally representing the answers to the MCU problems and therefore the answers to Far From Home's problems as well. You can't handle the hours of required content to enjoy the MCU fully, but the Amazing Spider-Man franchise is only a mere two movies. You can't stand the fact that 70% of every 
everything is a joke in the MCU, well, the Amazing Spider-Man franchise dials that comedy back a bit and actively tries to balance it out with those darker undertones. I mean, the Amazing Spider-Man 2 was more somber than No Way Home, which is actively acknowledged as an outlier in Phase 4's quality. You hate how the MCU can sometimes look stale and uninteresting visually? Well, that's pretty much the bread and butter of the Amazing Spider-Man franchise, with it being the common consensus that they are the best-looking live-action Spider-Man projects of all time. And you dislike how they make the MCU Peter look like Iron Man Jr. in Far From Home, and how he hasn't really had his own individual story yet? Well, in the Amazing Spider-Man movies, Peter can't really be a junior to anyone, since he's out there on his own. And Garfield's interpretation of the character may just be the best of any live-action variation, with his acting chops being the sole reason as to why certain things actually work in these movies. The Amazing Spider-Man franchise isn't the best that we have seen from the story of Spider-Man. As all external bias aside, these films are really landing to the mid to lower end when compared to every other theatrical project. It's just that sometimes as fans, we could conflate our personal enjoyment of films as judgment for the film's actual quality, not necessarily acknowledging that what we may be watching is actually bad out of our human nature to sometimes attach our identity to our likes and beliefs. But I don't think that the uproar that has been surrounding these films should be completely disregarded, as they are still giving valuable information as to what we want in our Spider-Man movies moving forward. You of course will have those negative attention seekers that will always try to go against the popular opinion, but for the most part, this amazing Spider-Man attention should be a direct wake-up call as to what the people want and need from their MCU Spidey, as he has always been the poster boy of the company and the epitome of what it means to be a relatable, self-insert character. The idea that anyone can be Spider-Man just adds that extra layer of attachment we as the viewer have and with such an illustrious history the title holds, we want this character to be represented in the highest limelight he can during his MCU tenure. So I believe that now more than ever is the time to give that extra listener to towards those viewers, because while No Way Home was an amazing first step, now more than ever is it time to change things up. We need those more focused stories to really explore that iconic solo Spider-Man mythos. We want better characterization to flesh out who Peter Parker is really when he has no one else to build off of. And we want his character to continue to show us what spectacles he can create on the big screen when he is only left with his ingenuity and pure wits. Because Spider-Man is a character that is meant for the people. And even when we become blinded by our admiration, everyone has the same goal of wanting this character to be given the justice he deserves. And if that includes giving Garfield a third movie of the night, I guess that's the way to go. Everywhere I go, I see his face. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. If you want to see me react to some more questionable takes that Twitter have come up with, including a crazy one about Miguel O'Hara, then go and watch my film Hot Takes video. And if you want more Spider-Man content surrounding arguably the best theatrical Spider-Man movie of all time, go and watch my Miles Morales analysis video. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel, and have a great day.